Thanks to all the moms and special thanks to my mom whenever she watches this. She's amazing and she is a gift of my life. And the season I'm living in now is a result of many of the prayers that she has prayed over my life. So we're in week four of our series entitled, What is the Gospel? Turn to your neighbor and ask them, what is the gospel? If you can't answer that question, you need to go back and listen. We've spent three weeks in great detail describing what is the gospel of Jesus. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 1 through 11. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to read to you. You can pull it up on your app. It's not going to be on the screen behind me, but you'll probably want your Bible out just to have note of it so you can take notes and highlight. Where are my people who it bothers you to like write in your Bible or highlight your Bible and you feel like, yeah, you need to buy just a Bible that you use just for writing in, you know what I'm saying? Just highlighting notes and then have your one that's pristine. See, the one I preach out of is the one that's pristine because when there's highlights, though, I can't read the text. It's hard for me, but my study Bible now, it's got some markings. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. I want to speak to you from this subject, foundations and fruits of the gospel. Foundations and fruits of the gospel. Do you know that Paul spent 18 months with Corinth, in Corinth, planting and forming this church? 18 months. Every day he was preaching, he was teaching, he was building, he was developing, and he leaves for just, just a couple years and everything goes crazy. That shows you how difficult it is to create something and to form something and to establish something. An apostolic gifting and an anointing is great, and we need apostolic people with apostolic anointings to create foundations, but it can quickly move away from the foundations when that leader is not present and when somebody else moves in. It's like if your boss is gone from work for a couple of weeks and comes back, it's like, what happened to the company? <laughs> what happened to everything? This is kind of what happened to Corinth. Paul leaves for just a little bit and, and they've gone crazy. And he writes several letters to them. We have two of the recorded letters, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, that he wrote to the church at Corinth, but they had all kinds of issues, all kinds of problems. And this was the Apostle Paul. That's why I'm always in conversation with pastors who may feel discouraged about their progress over 18, 24, 36 months. I said, it took Paul 18 months every day, and it fell apart in two years. Breathe. Relax. Trust in the grace and the power of God. It takes time. Things take time to change. Things take time to be established. 
That's what I've communicated over and over in people's lives. They say, I want to grow in God. I want to be deeper in his presence. I want to do these things. You have to be consistent in building foundations for a very long time. In order to go higher, you have to go deeper. In order to grow further, you have to go. There is a strain of bamboo that exists that does not visibly grow for two years. It doesn't move an inch for two years. All the while, the roots are surging down deep to contain the growth that will occur in over a week's timing. This shoot of bamboo can grow up to 80 feet plus in a week. That's how things are in the kingdom of God. It's like a seed that when planted is the smallest of all seeds. And then all of a sudden, it begins to grow. And it begins to take over the areas of life and the struggles and the situations and the resistance that we find in life. This is a principle in the kingdom of God. That's why Paul had to communicate to the church at Galatia, do not grow weary in doing good, for in due season you will reap if you remain faithful to what's been planted. There are foundations that have to be laid. Paul realized after 18 months of intense formation and building, he leaves for just a couple of years, and then he has to write to them about all kinds of subjects. He writes to them about spiritual revelation. He writes to them about lawsuits and how believers should act in court. He writes about marriage and sexual purity and what the, the relationship between a man and a woman and a household should look like. He writes about how to treat in-laws. Come on, for all of those who have their in-laws with them, there is a biblical way to honor and treat them. Don't you buy into culture and start being mean to in-laws? Don't call them monster in-laws or anything. That's how you wreck a marriage. I got people who've been treating in-laws terrible for years and wondering why their marriage isn't great because there's this tension underneath. This is a free marriage conference right here. Spouse. Husband, you never address your wife's in-laws. She addresses them. You don't correct them. You don't tell them what to do. The wife addresses her family. Men, you address your family. You bring the concerns and grievances and worries that your spouse has about your family to your family. Your wife doesn't need to call and say, y'all are terrible. That's how you wreck relationships because they didn't birth your spouse. They birthed you. And they're always going to end up siding with you. And then it creates tension in the marriage. That had nothing to do. I, somebody needed that today. That, that was left field. So whoever needed that, that's the Holy Spirit to you. That was out of nowhere. That has absolutely nothing to do with my message. Paul wanted to rehearse with the church at Corinth the foundations. There are foundations that we cannot get away from. There are foundations that people in today's society are quickly abandoning that are foundational to the truth of the gospel of Jesus. You cannot create what is called syncretism or a mix of religions that has a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of New Age and a little bit of yoga and a little bit of spirituality and a little bit... Like, that's not how foundations work. Foundations aren't up for debate. There are pillars of truth upon which the truth of God's word rests, and there are pillars that uphold the gospel that are non-negotiable. This is Mother's Day, and I feel like preaching. My mom would be so excited when she sees this, how fired up I am about the gospel. So there are foundations that Paul has to rehearse, and he just spent at length time talking about spiritual gifts and tongues and interpretation in the context of the local gathering, which we experience today. I'm grateful to be in a church where we do not quench the spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, or despise prophecy, but we earnestly desire, 1 Corinthians 14, the spiritual gifts and their functionality in the body of Christ. If you have any questions about those, I'm happy to have coffee with you and talk all about spiritual gifts and the functionality in the local church. Paul goes at length about spiritual gifts, and then there's a shift that occurs. He says, I know y'all love healings and tongues and prophecies and all that, and you need to, and that's great. But y'all have strayed away from some foundations, 
And you need to be reminded of the foundations because, write this down, number one, you never graduate from the gospel. You and I will never graduate from the gospel. Look in verses one and two. Now, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are currently being saved, if, somebody say if. Okay, this is what's called in grammar an if-then clause. That means it is a conditional statement. You are being saved if you hold fast to what I've preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Write that down. You never graduate from the gospel. Paul said, I need you to understand a few things. The gospel is received, the gospel is stood upon, and the gospel is clung to or held to. The gospel is received. See, these are my sub points for those of you note takers who like this. The gospel is received. What I do after the service, I look at Tiffany's notes, who's not here, and I look and see if my outline for my message is scripted in her notes to see if I communicated what I feel like God told me to. The gospel is received. The gospel is You've, it's held onto, it's stood upon, and it's held onto. The gospel is received. The term is paralambano. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, para lambano. Now you're talking Greek. This is a compound phrase of a preposition and a verb placed together, which means to formally receive an authoritative teaching. Paul said, I gave you something that was not just religious jargon. I gave you something that I received from the resurrected, glorified Jesus on the road to Damascus and what was communicated to me by the apostles and how I was formed in the desert, according to Galatians 1, for three years, studying and learning and growing in my relationship with Jesus. He said, I'm giving you something that's not just religious speech and jargon, but it is authoritative for your life. The gospel is authoritative and must be received. I can preach it, and Paul could preach it, but just preaching it does not get you saved. The individual has to receive and take in the authoritative teaching that is given in order for it to be effective in their life. The gospel must be received. That's why it requires an open heart. The children in ministry today and children's ministry are learning about the parable of the sower, that there are four types of soil, and only one of the four types receive the word of God and the fruit that it produces. It's not always the preacher's fault. Jesus said, in my ministry, I'm going to have a 25% success rate when I teach parables. There's going to be one out of four, in essence, who will hear me and really take it to heart and be changed by it. There's a reason that he was killed because people didn't receive what he was saying. You can hear the truth of the gospel, shut your ears to it, having ears, the Old Testament prophets said, they do not hear. Their hearts have been hardened to it. You've got to receive the gospel. Today, it's not just enough that you prayed a prayer at an altar 20 years ago, 2 years ago, 15 years ago, 70 years ago. That's not enough. You have to receive it daily. I'm not saying that you have to earn it daily. Receiving is not earning. Receiving is just somebody's giving me something and I'm receiving it. You have to receive the gospel in your life every day. The reality of what Christ has done for you and who he is in your life. You've got to receive it. People are wondering why their life isn't transformed and changed. And, and, and one of the reasons is they, they heard somebody say, if you receive him as Lord, then your life will be changed, but didn't realize that that means receiving him every day. The reception of the salvation of the Lord is not just a one-time past experience. It's a daily walk. That's why Jesus said, only those who take up their cross and follow me experience this gospel that I'm preaching. Daily receiving. I about knocked this over. Tiffany always warns me in the videos when she walks, watches that one day I'm going to knock this over. And I will, so y'all are just going to have to have grace when everything I have breaks. 
I'm just going to shoot from the hip for what the Lord gave me. The gospel has to be received. The gospel being received creates a reality we must be aware of. All of human history is determined by two groups of people. From everyone who's ever lived in the past to everyone who will ever live in the future, there are only two groups of people, those who have received the gospel and those who have not. Jesus says in Matthew 25, he says, the sheep and the goats. He says, at the end of the age, the eschaton, the last of everything, the wheat and the tares, the sheep and the goats, they'll be separated out. And all of human history will be divided into what people did with the message of the gospel. The gospel is something to take in and receive, not just once way back when, but every day. Once it's received, Paul said you have to stand upon it. To stand upon the gospel does not just mean like, here's the gospel And I'm going to step up on top of it and stay there. Standing upon the gospel means really clinging to it and not giving up any ground. Not relinquishing any space. Not not giving up any territory. That you're standing your ground and you're not going to be shaken. And you're not going to be moved from the truth of the gospel. You're not going to be shaken when the world comes and pandemics happen and political upheavals take place and wars and rumors of wars and societal cultural wars. You're going to stand there and having done all to stand, you're going to stand firm. You're going to be like in Psalm 1, a tree planted by living waters whose season, it, it never goes out. The leaf never withers and they're always by the stream. To stand Upon the gospel is not just, well, here's the gospel and I'm going to stand. It means that when life and the winds of life are rocking against your boat, it means that when you feel like life is a hurricane and in the swirl of the wind. How many of you have ever been in a hurricane before? We're in Oklahoma. This is a bad example. How many of you have ever seen a tornado? We were in Virginia Beach and we had hurricanes all the time before. But, but you understand that the force of the winds that come in the same way there are, are tornadic events in life where the winds come and they rock us and shake us to the core. That is the time where you stand. And Jesus said it like this. He said, you do not build your house on the sand because when the winds of life come and the storms of life come, it shakes and that house has a great fall and a great destruction, a great tragedy. But those who build their life on the rock, Jesus Christ, the head of the church, the the, the king of the kingdom of God, the one who is the subject and the object of the gospel, those who build their life on him and stand upon him, the winds come, the rain comes, the winds blow, the waves rock, and they shall never be moved and they shall not be shaken. Paul told the church at Corinth, you've got to receive it and then you've got to stand upon it. He went one step further and said, you've got to hold fast to it. You've got to hold fast to it because by it we are being saved. Now does... Now, we're going to go into some grammar here for just a moment. This form is not a past tense form, meaning he didn't say you were saved. You are being saved. Salvation is not just a past tense experience. And language matters. How we say things matters. It's not just I was saved when, yes, I was. When I was five, I I placed saving faith in Jesus and gave my life to him. Okay? Yes, I was saved then, but right now in this moment, I'm being saved by his grace and by his mercy. And guess what? I will be saved in the coming day of judgment, not because of deeds of my own righteousness, but because of his blood covenant that he entered into and covered my life and gave me his righteousness and his holiness and his goodness and placed it on my life and changed me, took out this heart of stone and gave me a heart of flesh. That's why I will be saved from the coming judgment of the last day. For he who began a good work, first, or Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. That means the day of the Lord, his parousia, his return, his coming. 
in that moment, they will be saved because of the work he saved them and was saving them and will save them. So sometimes we feel that we graduate from the gospel because we got saved when we were, you know, 30 years ago, and we've just moved on from that. Paul said, I don't care how many spiritual gifts you operate in. I don't care how deep you think you are. You can never go any deeper than being planted and founded upon the truth of the gospel. It is the gateway to all of the kingdom of God. We never move past it. We never graduate from it. We never graduate from the cross. We never graduate from his death. We never graduate from his burial. We never graduate from his resurrection and his ascension. We never graduate from his sacrifice. We never graduate from the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of the kingdom of God. So when life comes and the winds come, never let go of the gospel. Never let go. You will be so tempted in so many points in your life to to let go of the grip and keep God at an arm's length. And it's too hard when things are difficult to be close to him because you may say something could have happened or he could have done something or why am I going through this? And, And it's easy when the winds blow to push further and further and keep him further away. Never let go of the gospel. The gospel is best when life is worse. The gospel works best in terrible situations. The gospel's power shows its greatness in our strongest moments of weakness. The gospel is made perfect and beautiful in our lives. Never graduate from the gospel. Paul said something else in verses 3 through 8. Let's look again and see what he says about the foundations and fruit of the gospel. For I delivered to you as of first importance... When somebody says first importance, that means it's really, that means it's primary. It's supremely important. What I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. He was buried and raised on the third day according to Scripture. And he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to to me. Write this down. Know the gospel's foundations. In an age where truth is being tested, sociologists and psychologists are not even sure what to call the time period we're in now. It was post-modernity. That was kind of the tagline that was used. Post-modernism was the thought process of multiple truths based upon the feelings of individuals and peoples. But now, Sociologists and psychologists are not even sure that we're in post-modernity. Some think that we've moved even beyond post-modernity and entered into a different stage. They don't even know what to call it yet. Our society has grown stranger and stranger with regards to foundational truths. There is an assault on reality and truth like never before. Just basic facts, basic realities... I'm not even talking about spiritual things. I'm just talking about basic facts and realities that are true whether you're a Christian or not. (laughs) Even things that are most basic are being challenged in today's world because of the perception of individuals. But individual perception does not change eternal truth. The way that somebody perceives something doesn't mean that that's true or not. That's just the way that you've experienced and perceived it. That doesn't make it true or not true. True is not a set of propositions and standards. The problem at its core is that people do not understand that truth is not propositions, but truth is a person. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the the logos from the beginning, the word. This is a Greek term that means all of the rational thought and all the processing of the mind even is, is found in Christ. So every math equation that has a right answer, the truth of that understanding is actually found in a set of of laws that Christ himself has ordained to bring about that result. Because all truth finds itself in Christ. Even Pilate asked this question some 2,000 years ago, what is truth? The questioning of truth is not just a contemporary problem, but has been a significant issue throughout the human existence. A questioning and an assault on 
truth. But Paul said, I, I've got to tell you something that is true and is of first importance. That means before you look into or learn anything else, you need to know this thing. You need to have these foundations. I'm telling you today, you need to know the four foundations I'm about to give you found in verses 3 through 8, like the back of your hand. I don't know the back of my hand very well. It's just a colloquial phrase, okay? You need to know these four pillars of truth and the foundations upon which Paul said the gospel rests backwards and forwards. You need to be able to know them so well that you can say them in your sleep. You need to have these internalized and ingrained in you so that at the right moment, when the opportune time comes, you know the foundations in your own life when you're tested, in your own human experience, and the experiences of the people God places around you. There will come a time when you will need to share these foundations, and every believer needs to know these foundations. They are supremely important. Number one, Christ died for our sins. The preposition for is theologically important. He died for our sins. This is substitutionary atonement language. That means that he died on behalf of or in the place of you and me. This is a central truth that is under assault right now. Even in theological seminaries and trainings, people are arguing about the substitutionary atonement of Christ, that he died for us. This is a foundational truth that cannot be overturned. It is a pillar of the gospel of Jesus that God punished Jesus on the cross in our place so that we could be reconciled back to God. The substitution, the Lamb of God slain before the foundations of the world in our place. Christ died for us. Our sins. Now, the way that he died was different than the slaughtering of a bull and a goat. In the Old Testament, sins could be forgiven if a bull or a goat was killed and the blood was placed on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. They would have the Day of Atonement. If you read Leviticus 16 through 18, you'll find the details there. The Day of Atonement, they had annual sacrifice on the Day of Atonement, but then they had kind of more regular sacrifices that are described in Leviticus 1 and following that detail out the sin offering, the guilt offering, the mistakes, and all these things. The Old Testament Hebrew people could be forgiven of sin. So what makes Jesus' death different than the blood of bulls and goats? Well, the book of Hebrews does a comparative analysis between that which was old and the new that is found in Christ. And the difference is that Christ's death not only forgives sin, but it breaks the authority of sin over us, and it frees us from its authority and its dominion. The blood of a bull or a goat or an animal sacrifice could never do that. That's why the sacrifice of Jesus is so far superior because he destroyed, 1 John chapter 3, sin and the works of the devil over us so that we could be free. You do not have to live in a repetitive sin cycle. Well, I messed up again and then I do it. I'll just pray and ask, I messed up again. And I... The blood of Jesus is stronger than that. It breaks sin's power over your life so that you can be freed from whatever that struggle is and that issue. Christ died for our sins. This is a foundational pillar of the gospel. It's been in the earliest church creeds, in the Apostles' Creed, in the Nicene Creed, in the Chalcedonian Creed. It's been all the early church councils and the creeds that Christ died for us. And Paul said, you've got to know this. I'm excited that you're learning how to live pure in your, in your relations. I'm excited that you're learning how to sue people or not sue people in court. I'm excited that you're speaking in tongues and prophesying. I want you to keep doing that and pursue that. But you've got to know these things. We talked about it for 18 months. And y'all have already forgotten it. You've got to commit these things to the heart. Christ died for our sins. Number two, Christ was buried. Now you're going to notice something in each of these statements. Christ died for our sins in accordance to the scriptures. 
his death was not some accidental, ah, uh, he made some, you know, political leaders upset in Rome, so they executed Jesus as, as one who committed treason uh, governmentally, which that was one of the accusations that they did levy against him. But this was in accordance to the divine plan of God in the prophetic scriptures. If you read Isaiah 53, he was crushed for our iniquities. He was, he was bruised. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes or his wounds, we are healed, made whole. The scriptures were declaring of his death that was coming hundreds of years before it happened. His death for our sins was validated by the scriptures, but then he said he was buried. Because burial is proof of death. This was not in accordance to the scriptures. You'll see he died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, but he was buried functions as the evidence or proof that he died. You don't bury somebody who's alive. Burial indicates the veracity or the truthfulness of one's death. If one dies, then they get buried. Paul said, you've got to know this because there was an error theologically that was swirling around and trying to contradict that Jesus really came in the flesh. These were Gnostics, some of them, and there were other kind of false religions swirling around where they were like, well, he just kind of faked dying, and he didn't really die. He wasn't really a person. He just kind of, he, he, he was deity, and he, he just kind of played dead so that all of us would think he died. And then he just kind of woke up, and, and, and he wanted to put on the death show for us so we'd think that heaven. No, he, Jesus was fully God and fully man. The Kenotic doctrine of Philippians 2, 5 through 11 says that he emptied himself of all divine attributes. He put them aside and he lived fully human, empowered by the Spirit. He didn't do a single miracle until the Holy Spirit came upon him at his baptism. He, he lived as a human, showing us the way to live truly. We say, well, he's God. Well, he laid aside all the godly attributes and lived fully as a perfect man led by the power of the Holy Spirit, he came back in and began preaching Luke chapter 4. He was buried as evidence of this real death. Jesus really died. Swoon theory, all these other things, he just passed out. The, the beating that he endured and the suffering that he endured, this is a tenet that you can't let go. It's a foundation. He was buried. The burial is significant as a validation of his death. There's a third pillar. Write this down. Christ was raised on the third day. Now, again, you'll see the phrase, according to the scriptures, because this was prophesied again and again. Jesus talked about it. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a seed. But if it dies, it'll bear much fruit. Speaking of his own death, Psalm 16, 10, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. Psalm 110, 1, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Jonah 1, 17, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of a fish three days and three nights. Jesus said in Matthew 12, Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Hosea 6.2 says after two days He will revive us, and on the third day He will raise us up that we may live before Him. The Old Testament Scriptures were heralding His resurrection, and Jesus pulled on that prophetic tradition and began to declare, I will rise. This is a foundation that cannot be disputed. If Jesus did not rise, we should be pitied among all people and considered foolish for what we're gathering here to do today. This is the remainder of 1 Corinthians 15. The resurrection is the hinge upon which the power and the truth of the gospel swings. And if we do not have the resurrection, we are a sad bunch of people. That's what I'm just, I'm paraphrasing Paul. That's, that's Paul. Love all of you. Uh, but, but Paul said, if we don't have this, we're wasting our time. 
that's why the resurrection is so foundational. If Jesus did not raise, we would not be raised in the last day. He is a first fruits resurrection demonstration exhibit A. And God said in the same way that I raised up Jesus, I will raise you up in the last day. And I will give you a glorified body. And you will be with me eternally forever. And you will be my people. And I will be your God. And I will be the light of the city and the Lamb. And the throne of the Lamb will be in the center and we will worship him forever. Upon the resurrection hinges all of the truth and promises of the gospel. Without it, there are no promises available. The resurrection is foundational. And number four, Christ appeared. Now, this was not according to the scriptures, but again, it's evidence. He died according to the scripture. Burial was evidence that he died. He rose according to the scripture. His post-resurrection appearances were evidence. He appeared to Peter. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24 said, He has appeared to Cephas, Peter. He appeared to the twelve. They were hiding out in a room, afraid and worried of what would happen to them. And Jesus said, Peace be with you. And he told Thomas, he said, look at my hands. And look at my side. You believe because you see. Blessed are those who believe and do not see. That's me and you. He appeared to, Paul said, some 500 people. He was showing up to everybody around Corinth. And, and Paul said, listen to me. If you don't believe me, this is, in essence, what he's saying. If you don't believe in according to the scriptures and the message that I'm preaching, why don't you just go out and conduct an interview with these 500 people? Maybe one or two can have an, a, a hallucination or some kind of illusion or in their grief, whatever. He said, there are over 500 people who are sitting out there who saw him, who saw his nails pierced hands, who saw his nail pierced feet, who saw his pierced side, who had a visitation from the resurrected, glorified Jesus. Go and visit them. See if I'm lying. Go talk to them. Go sit down and have a meal with them. Go have some bread together. They didn't do too much gluten-free back then, but... People online, thank you for laughing. I, I really appreciate that. I heard that. He appeared and proved himself to be alive. And, and Paul said, he uses this term as a one born untimely. The term is actually the same term used for a miscarriage or something uh, that's gone wrong because Paul had so persecuted the church and had botched his opportunity when it came to him and killed and approved of the killing of Stephen and the persecution of the church. But then the resurrected Christ met him at a different time than he met everybody else. And he said, like one untimely born who wasn't born at the right time, who came before their due date or after their due date and had problems, he said, that was me and I. I saw him too, and I went from one way of living, and now I'm living another way. And what I know is that I met him in between the two paths, and I was 100% on the persecution bandwagon for the righteousness of God and the purity of our faith. But I have met the Lord Jesus, and he has changed me. These are the foundations that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. That he was buried as evidence of his death. That he was raised according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to people to prove himself. Luke chapter 1 through many, or Acts chapter 1 through many infallible proofs. He proved himself to be alive. This is the foundation. Anytime you see people attacking the foundations, they are not in agreement with the word of God. They are not in agreement with the foundations of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anytime you see these foundations under assault, know that it's not of the kingdom of God. The words of people will pass away, but his words will never pass away. And these foundations are eternal. His word is sealed in heaven, and they are the eternal pillars upon which our eternal life is gained. The pillars know the foundations backwards. And forwards. We never graduate. We've got to know. Write this down. We've got to experience the fruits of the gospel. Verses 9 through 11. Here's where I'm landing. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God. 
How many of you are grateful for his grace today? By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me, whether then it was I or they. So we preached, and so you believed. The gospel is not merely something that we believe. It's something that we receive. It's not the mental ascent of, I believe that Christ did this. It's when we receive it into our lives and are changed by it that its benefits and promises are applied to our life. It's not just enough to believe. Even the demons believe and tremble. We've got to move past the concept of this mental ascent, believing the right things in our mind but not allowing them to get to our heart. Having so much knowledge in our head, but never application in our heart. We've got to move past that. We've got to move beyond that. And it can only be established by the right foundations. The right foundations lead to the right fruits. The gospel produces fruit in people's lives. When I don't see fruit in people's lives, I am concerned about their relationship with God. Not out of judgment. People quote Matthew 7 about judge not, or you will be judged, and the measure with which you judge will be judged back to you. But then Jesus tells right after that, you need to know who false teachers are and people who are deceiving you and people who aren't leaving. Like, we've gotten this whole thing about not judging me. I don't, I'm not anybody's judge. I'm, I'm not, God is the only judge. I, I don't know what he will eternally decide about people's lives. Only he and has the final verdict over a person's life. What we are called to do is hold each other accountable. Not in a judgmental way, but in a loving way. John the Baptist said, you've got to bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Your life needs to be demonstrating that you actually believe in Jesus. I mean, I know people who've professed Christ for a decade and haven't done one thing in the kingdom of God. I'm not, I'm not judging anybody. I'm just, I'm, I'm just being, can I just be honest with you? Just for my, I, I don't like charades and playing. There are people who pray prayers, walk away from them, never do anything connected to God for a couple decades. That's not the fruit of the gospel. The fruit of the gospel is a changed life. The demonstration of salvation are are works connected to that flow out of the grace we experience. The grace of God for Paul motivated two things in him. Humility and hard work. These are two of the most evident fruits of the gospel. Humility and hard work. Notice that throughout Jesus' ministry, those who were puffed up all the time were the religious leaders who were looking down their noses at everyone, who were peering and evaluating constantly their lives, who were setting up sting operations to catch them in in all kinds of sins. I mean, these people were very arrogant in their own walk of righteousness with God. And yet the Pharisees and religious leaders who prayed eloquent and flowery prayers that everyone heard There was a man who was in the crowd, Jesus said, who beat his chest and said, Son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. That man went home justified. And the religious leader who had all the right phrases and things to say, he wasn't justified. There is a humility in your life that the gospel produces. Pride is the antithesis of the gospel. Pride comes before a great fall. God resists the proud. If you want to get God to be opposed to you, be prideful. That's a powerful truth from the book of James. When pride enters in and you begin to view yourself better than others and better and you start using your life to it, other people's lives as a measuring stick against your own and start saying, well, I'm doing better than they are and I'm, I'm a lot further along than this person. I'm, I'm doing just fine. I, I, I'm fine. Only those who are poor in spirit inherit the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Humility is the gateway into everything in the kingdom of God. 
It's a dependence totally on the sacrificial death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus that produces everything in our life. We did not contribute one thing. He even gave us the faith to respond to him by his prevenient grace that goes before. You thought that was just something in your heart burning, this sensation that you just kind of felt like you needed to change. That was his grace going before, tenderizing our hearts to respond even to his call. Our salvation is the total work of the Father and the death of the Son and the application of it by the Holy Spirit and the deposit of the Spirit, Ephesians 1.14, into our lives, into our hearts. The gospel should produce humility. I get concerned when there are a ton of prideful people in a church. I get very concerned Because it's the poor in spirit who inherit the benefits of the kingdom of heaven. I'm grateful that I get to pastor such incredible people with such humility. I've heard so many of your stories around tables and at coffee and in my study here at the church. And I'm so blessed by your humility. Never lose that fruit of the gospel. Always let humility reign in your life. Here's the other thing. The gospel produces the fruit of hard work. There is a lie that is prevailing in society right now and in Christian culture of this idea of just resting in God. Let me unpack this because I believe in resting in God and finding our refuge in Him and taking Sabbath and having times of rest. But the book of Hebrews says that Jesus is our rest. Just taking five weeks and watching Netflix and saying, I feel rested is not rest. I guarantee you, you'll feel more tired after that than you did before the break. Because Jesus is our rest. And only when we're in his presence are we revived and renewed. Now, I love watching a movie or a show with my wife. I'm not, I, don't have a, I don't have a problem with a streaming service or a TV or whatever. I'm just saying that's not going to provide you the rest that your soul longs for. Only Jesus can. Only the truth of his gospel. Only the place of prayer. Only his house can give you the nourishment that you need to continue to produce the fruit of hard work. What I mean by this is I've heard people say, I'm going to be doing ministry in a few years, and I'm just in a season of rest. I'm just not going to do anything for about three or four or five years. I just, I can imagine what Paul I mean, we, we saw how Paul treated John Mark when he got skittish. He's like, get out. Get, go back home. Get off this mission trip right now. And then he's like, I don't want to be with John Mark. I don't want to see John Mark. Then God reconciled the relationship, and he said he's profitable for me in ministry because God loves reconciling relationships. But this idea of I'm just going to take a 10-year break. I'm, I'm just going to. I'm just going to I'm going to let other people use their gifts. You know, I used my gifts for a few years and now I'm just going to kind of rest. I'm going to see I understand periods and times of refreshing and replenishing and taking a few months sabbatical and those kind of things. But what the fruit of the gospel is and what it produces is hard work. Jesus said those who put their hand to the plow and turn away are not fit for work in the kingdom of God. This is not a shame thing. This is not, you never graduate from working for the kingdom of God. Well, I worked for 30 years. I'm, I'm done. I'm going to go on a private island and I'm, I'm, I've served my time. You're finished when you die. You never stop working for the purpose of the gospel and the kingdom of God in the earth. You, there, 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 aren't, there aren't decade-long vacations. The time is short. Christ is coming back, and the labors are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers. Your greatest identity is not just son or daughter. One of the greatest badges that I love to wear is labor in the harvest field of God. I'm a laborer. I will blister my hands for the purposes of God. I would rather be shipwrecked and sleepless nights like Paul than dwell in the opulence and wealth of wickedness. I would rather have lack and need and and be impoverished and beaten half to death like Paul, knowing of the supreme and eternal joys of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fruit of the gospel is not vacations, and I'm going to let everybody else do it, and I don't do that. The fruit of the gospel is, I'm going to put my hand to the plow, 
And I'm going to see the hardened soil in my city, at my workplace, at my job site, in my family. I am going to rake and plow. I am going to work, and I'm going to work. But it's not my work. It's the grace of God working through me. See, that's where people get burnt out when you try to do it in your own strength. It's not by might or by your power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. When you labor in God's vineyard, it becomes easy when you're doing it in His Spirit and in His his strength. When you're just going out trying to just knock it hard soil and make stuff happen. But when you follow the leading of the Spirit and every nudge that He gives you, you say yes and every door that He opens you walk through, you find that His, his burden is light and His yoke is easy. It's it's restful when we labor with him because when we are yoked to him, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, when we are yoked with him, he carries all the weight. He carries, we're like the young oxen. This is the imagery when, when two oxen were yoked together to plow a field. This is God's field. This is God's gospel. This process belongs to him. And he said, come and learn from me. My way is easy. And he said, watch this. I'm going to do all the heavy lifting. I'm going to go before, and I'm going to stir this person through a dream. And I'm going to shake them to their core. And I'm going to put them in a position where they actually end up coming to you and saying, Why, where, what is the reason for the hope that you have within? You see how easy work becomes then? Work just becomes following his work. He's already plowed the field. He's already went before us. Like the word in worship was, he's went before us and behind us. He's done all the heavy lifting. We just get to reap all of the beautiful benefits of his grace. That's why Paul said, I am humble because I know that it's not just me out there. Well, bless God, I'm just going to work myself to the bone. I'm just going to make this count. No, he said, this is the grace of God working through me. And that's why to the day that Paul died, he could say, my race is finished. And I ran it well. Because I wasn't getting winded and losing steam. Here's why. Because his grace was sufficient even in my weakest moments when I wanted to quit and give up. His grace and his work in my life was hard at work. So that I could join and put my hand in his hand in his field and begin to see the harvest of his gospel. Church, we have to know the foundations of the gospel. And we have to know that those foundations produce fruit. There needs to be fruit in our lives. I'm not saying you're always going to recognize it. Often it's other people who see the fruit and call it out and encourage you and say, wow, I see that. I see your faithfulness in your life. But the gospel is not just something we hear and say yes to 20 years and, and we get out of jail free card and we just live in kind of a bubble and get wings and go to heaven and do that. The gospel is a daily experience that produces stuff in our life. It produces fruit in us. It produces humility in us. It produces hard work. Church, let's just stand together. Prayer team, I'm going to ask those of you who you know who you are, if you'll just come and stand up here at the front. We want to create some space for response just as the music plays. I want to give some opportunities, and then if it's you, I just want you to come up and receive ministry and prayer. I'm going to pray from the stage, but, but some of you are going to need the laying on of hands to see this received in your life. If you would right now, if you just open up your hands in front of you, just in a posture of reception, this is something we receive. This is something that we receive. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. It's just received. Father, thank you for your grace. It is sufficient for everything we need. I, I feel this strongly. If, if you're under the sound of my voice and you say, I, I need to see those fruits in my life. I, this doesn't mean you've been a bad believer. It doesn't mean that you've went terribly off court. This is not saying you did any of those things. If you just say, I need to see the increased fruits of the gospel in my life. I need that evidence. I, I just want you, right now, I'm going to do some prayer ministry from the stage, but I just want you to come up to one of the prayer team men, members 
and they just want to pray for you. If you say, yes, I, I, want to, I want to see those fruits flow in my life. I want to see the fruits flow in my life. I don't want to just take a vacation and just live life in the rat race and then one day hope I get to heaven and do, I want to see the fruit in my life. I'm going to pray and as I'm praying, if that's you, it's not too late. Just come up and receive personal ministry. Father, thank you that your fruits are available in our life. Your abundant fruits. Father, I thank you that your presence, your grace, your mercy, your truth brings transformation in our lives. Brings real change. Brings real hope. It brings real peace in stormy waters of life. It brings real transformation, Father. I thank you for the fruits of the gospel. I thank you that people right now are exchanging bad fruit, that they feel like they've not been producing what they've been supposed to be producing. They're like, I'm, I know I'm supposed to be an apple tree, but I'm just getting oranges. It's like I'm not producing what I'm intended to produce. Father, thank you for bringing fruit in their life in keeping with your truth and your gospel. Lord, may each person here, may the trees of our life, may the branches of our life be so heavy with fruit that they would drape like a willow tree to the ground, that there would be easy picking for the world around, for the hurting around, for the lost around, that they would see and enjoy the fruits that come forth from faithfulness to the pillars of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, let your fruits flow in our life. All of the fruits of the Spirit, the gentleness, the meekness, the patience, the loving kindness, the self-control. Father, I thank you for all the fruits that you give us. Some of you have doubted whether God is producing things in your life, and I just sense him saying, I am bringing you into a season of produce, not just production. Some of you have had this mindset in your life about your life with God being this production, like he has a tally marks, and did they do this, and did they do this, and did they do this, and you're going to enter into a season where you're just producing out of the overflow of your connectedness to God. It's going to be easy in this next season. You're going to have opportunities that are easy. They're going to just happen, and you're going to say, I never knew life with God could be so easy. Produce in the name of Jesus. Church, I want to pray a prayer of blessing over you. If you would, just open your hands in front of you. Church, I bless you in the name of God the Father. I bless you in the name of God the Son. And I bless you in the name of God the Holy Spirit that your lives would be so full of fruit in your homes, in your cars, at your job sites, at your family gatherings, that fruit would just flow from your life. Fruit and fruit and fruit and fruit and fruit and that conversations would happen that you would easily be able to step into. Father, I thank you that you're blessing people with the right words at the right time. That you don't, I feel the Lord saying, you don't have to worry about what to say. I'm going to fill your mouth, and it's going to be like fruit to that person's soul. It's going to be like nourishment. It's going to be just what they need. You don't have to worry about what to say. The words will be spoken to you in the right time, at the right place. I bless your hands and feet as you go out today to carry the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not out of obligation, but with great joy, that you would carry it faithfully. You would carry it faithfully everywhere you go. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed and through prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Church, you were blessed when you came in. You're blessed as you go out.